Good evening. Good to see each of you for a prayer meeting tonight. We welcome you to Bethel. It's good to see you. I want to mention a few prayer requests and a couple of announcements. We'll start with just a few announcements. Please remember Sunday, June the 5th. Hard to believe this is June the 1st. June the 5th, we'll have a graduation Sunday. On June the 5th, we'll have another one on June the 12th. The deadline is already coming past for June the 5th for you to sign up. Uh, if you have a late edition, you please need to let me know uh, pronto. Please, that would be a blessing. Um, so we, we don't miss anything. And then still have some time for the one on June the 12th. Please remember that. We also have homecoming at Bethel on June the 12th. The Hill family will be here singing that day. We're excited about that. Make sure to remember Vacation Bible School will be held on June 26th through the 30th. We're going to start on Sunday night this year. We usually don't do that, so it's going to start Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and there will be no Friday of the Bible School this year. Uh, so it's something different. It will be evening sessions, and we do need people to volunteer to help us. There's a sign-up sheet in the back vestibule back here. If you'd like to volunteer to help teach a class or or to chase youngins, that'd be a blessing to us. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, we need to corral as many as we can. Uh, let's uh, make sure and mention a couple of prayer requests this evening that are very important to our hearts. Uh, continue to pray for Michelle Blevins. She's uh, got bit by a spider. She's continued to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, back and forth to the doctor a couple of different times. She's had a little procedure done on it. She, in my opinion, I'm not a medical doctor but uh, there's more things she may need in the future. So let's be praying for her. It's pretty bad. It's, it's about yay big, and it's bad. Uh, so let's be praying for her. She's also feeling terrible. So I can't imagine what she's going through. Let's be praying for her. I pray also for a good friend of mine. He has got special object tonight. His name is uh, Baron Alson. Love Brother Baron and his family. Let's be praying for them. Pray also for Kelly Pittman. Pray for Brother Wayne Aulis. If you would pray for Chucky Renfro. I pray for Miss Carol Bruce, Miss Brenda Ng. I was able to visit her uh, yesterday. Had a good visit with her. Uh, she was going out to try to do some gardening. She had all her gardening tools. She was out trying to do some gardening. I was absolutely amazed. So continue to pray for her. Pray also for John Buchanan. Uh, pray for Miss uh, Ann Miller. Pray for uh, Brother Joe Aulis uh, that fell and broke his leg and up toward the hip area. Pray for Miss Nellie Fisher, Miss Crandall McClellan, Brother Donnie Aulis. Keep praying for him regarding his shoulder surgery. Pray for Betty and Harold Smith, Karen and Ray McKinney, Wanda and Robert Carpenter. I pray for Ray and Joyce Casper. Pray for my wife's grandmother, Miss Stella Francis. Pray for Eddie Gunter, John and Brandon Ward. Pray for Miss Juanita Vance. Uh, she's really struggling right, right now. Pray for her and pray for Doug and Kelly. Pray also for Johnny and Rachel Green. Pray for Tanya Westall. If you would pray for Brother Frank Gurley. Pray for Miss Ann Duckworth. Uh, pray for Miss Janet Hughes. Also Miss Kim McMahon. Pray for Carissa that she continues to get stronger. I tell you that young lady's certainly been a trooper with all that she's come through. Pray also for April Huskins. Pray for Brother Bobby uh, McClellan, Miss uh, Sandy Wilcox. Pray for Sister Mark Jackson, Brother John as well. I pray for Miss Patty Berenger, Miss Ruby Pritchard. Pray also for Dennis McClellan. Pray for Brother Will Miller. I pray for pray for Billy Matthews. Pray for K.D. Metcalf. I pray for Ron Pettit. Pray for Miss Judy Pittman. I continue to pray for Miss Tammy Fisher. Pray for Doug Harrell. I pray for our servicemen and women. We want to pray for Faith Daniels, and Brother Gabe Miller, Preston Burleson, Devin Burleson, Houston Holman, and um, Chad Davey, all from our church right here at Bethel. Let's be praying for all these service men and women. Pray for Miss Nella McClellan. Continue to pray for Preacher Arthur Buchanan. Pray for Briley Austin. Pray for the Raymond Lee family, also the Marshall Staten family. Uh, anybody else have a prayer request we'd like to mention tonight? Pray for Miss Phyllis. We'll do that. Okay. Let's remember that. Remember that. Remember that. Anybody else? I'll ask if you will please stand. I've got some special objects. I mean some heavy burdens on my heart. Father, we do thank you and we praise you for the opportunity you've given us tonight to gather in your house. And Lord, we look to you. We pray, God, you would 
lead us and guide us in all truth and manners. Lord, I ask now that you would help us this evening follow these that's on this prayer list, that God, your hand would be upon each and every special object, upon these individual uh, persons that have been aforementioned, God. May you touch these, Father, that's going through times of crisis with uh, cancer and, and these that's going through times of crisis, Lord, with uh, extreme sickness, spider bites, surgical procedures they're trying to recover from. Lord, we lift up Brother Doug Willis to you, Father. We know he's got some things going on tomorrow. Lord, I ask that you'll just help lead God and direct there. Father, I ask you tonight, God, you'll touch our nation. Lord, I pray for the war-torn country of the Ukraine. We pray for Russia. We pray, God, also for Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God, I pray for our president, our governor. We pray, God, for leadership in our White House. Lord, we pray, God, you'll touch our nation. We pray for our Congress, our Senate, God. We pray for our Supreme Court. Lord, I pray that righteousness would stand and that truth would no longer lie in the street. God, I pray that you would help us as just a preacher of the gospel. Lord, that tonight we might encourage someone along life's way. That, God, we might preach the truth, rightly dividing it, therefore. And, God, we ask your touch tonight and your help. We thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. We ask your blessing now, God, upon every need, God. You know every heart, every mind. God, every situation, Father, that we know not of. Lord, I pray your hand of mercy and your hand of guidance would be upon each need. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. amen. Thank you for standing tonight. If you would remain standing, Brother Seth's going to lead us in song. If we can get the words on the screen, we'll sing at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity
God for Calvary. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible tonight, we're interested in the book of Mark, the very first chapter of the book of Mark tonight. Mark chapter number one. We've begun a series on the book of Mark, and we're excited about that. It's treasures from the book of Mark. We just started last week. First message, we looked at the very first verse. We got really far, and uh, we studied about Mark, who was a uh, most unusual messenger. God had called a most unusual messenger to share the gospel, and we studied the life of John Mark. Tonight, we want to begin in verse number two. We want to preach on this thought tonight about a mighty, useful messenger, a mighty, Useful messenger. I was reading out of the book of 1 Kings, I believe it was, and it was uh, Elijah. Elijah had outrun Ahab. And when he got there, he announced the arrival of the king. And uh, I saw here on Sunday night, we had uh, Brother Basilio Alfaro. And before he got up to preach, I stood up to introduce him to our congregation to remind you of who he is. He's been here before and to try to draw your attention to receiving the man of God. And it is amazing how that uh, you and I need to realize that God always has someone to herald the arrival of God's servant. And when we see this heralding of the arrival of God's servant, we see John the Baptist. I begin to think about how God always has someone to introduce God's servant. So I have two questions I believe the Lord has laid on my heart for tonight. Number one, am I prepared for the arrival of God's servant? I mean, we know John the Baptist was the forerunner of the servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was prepared the way for Jesus, his birth and his ministry and his crucifixion, his death and his resurrection. John the Baptist laid the groundwork there. So one day Jesus is going to arrive again. He's coming back. Am I ready for, to receive the Son of God when he returns? I have a second question tonight. As a servant of God, am I being useful? Are you a useful servant of God or are you one that put, is put upon the shelf? Did you know that George Barna has said that for every 100 preachers that have surrendered to the ministry in 20 years, only 20 of them are still actively preaching. Interesting tonight, amen. One time uh, over in Madison County where my people's all from, uh, they had a pulpit and they had a little wall around the pulpit came out like this, a circular wall, and then came back so far. And the preacher had laid his notes down, just like I did a few minutes ago, laid his notes down on the pulpit there. And uh, when he did uh, lay his notes down, there was a, didn't have no air conditioning, had a gust of wind and a window that was behind him back there, came through and took his notes off the pulpit and blowed them down into the altar down below. All he could remember was he was preaching on behold, I come quickly. So he said, tonight I'm preaching on behold, I come quickly. And he reared back and he didn't know what to do. And he said, I said, behold, I come quickly. And he thought, I'll take a running jump and I'll jump over this banister and I'll get him down there in the altar and I'll pick up my notes and there'll be none the wiser. So he took a running jump, but something unusual happened. He stumped his toe on that wall and he went tumbling through the altar into the front row where three, lead, for three ladies were sitting. He went into their laps and he said, Oh, ladies, I'm so sorry. They said, Preacher, you warned us three times we ought to be ready. (laughs) Amen. Amen. You and I need to be ready to receive the servant of God as he comes back. Well, you may say, Preacher, why do you keep calling Jesus the servant of God? Mark always presents Jesus as the servant of God. Number one, I want us to look at the messenger. Verse two. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Mark is quoting the book of Malachi. 
chapter 3, verse 1, the Old Testament prophets were introducing God's servant who would soon arrive. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, is a quotation found in verse number 3. So Mark quoted Malachi 3, 1, and Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, about the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, which would prepare the way. Mark introduced him in verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It's John that God chose and called and used to prepare the way of this man Jesus. John the Baptist is a most unlikely, a most unusual, yet a most useful messenger. I believe that John the Baptist before Jesus was probably the greatest religious figure of his day. Yet, John was unimpressed with who he was. Now, I want to say something right here. Think about his purpose. Think about his promised birth. His mother couldn't have children. She was elderly. His daddy, elderly. And God promised them a child and said, Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. John means Jehovah gives grace. And guess what? When the baby was born, it said, He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. None of those things impress John about his promised birth. What about the prophecy, prophecies about him? The Lord said in Malachi 3, 5, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, preacher, then that's talking about during the tribulation. It also speaks about before the coming of the Christ child. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 17. Jesus addresses this situation. Matthew 17 and verse number 10. Look with me, please. We're studying the Word of God about the messenger, a mighty, useful messenger. Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Just in case you were sitting here thinking, Preacher Darren's talking about something. He's got his doctrine wrong. He's not rightly dividing the Word of God. He's talking about something that's going to happen in the tribulation. Yeah, it's going to, but Jesus just identified that he was talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist never got a big head about who he was concerning the prophecies about him. What about his popularity? Now go back to Mark. What about his popularity? Popularity is something that blows people's heads straight up. I mean it puffs them up. Look in chapter 1 verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Everybody was coming to hear John the Baptist preach. You, everybody says, well, I like to hear such and such preaching. I like to hear such and such preaching. Man, they've had revivals gone six weeks and eight weeks. Honey, let me tell you something. They all pale in comparison to the useful messenger of John the Baptist. Jesus said, of those that were born among women, that John the Baptist was the greatest of all of them, greater than Abraham, greater than David, greater than Isaiah, greater than Jeremiah, greater than Ezekiel, greater than Hosea. He's the greatest of all the men that had ever lived. And yet John the Baptist did not get puffed up. You know what he said? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Let, let's talk about his professions. Oh, we've been around people. Uh, Billy Graham had probably thousands, millions of people saved. He didn't get the big head about it. But I've seen people 
that got out working for God and people started getting saved and it messed up their thought process. It messed up their heart. It messed up just because somebody started encouraging you and talking to you. Honey, you got the big head and now you started believing what they were saying about you and you come in with a strut. I'm telling you, you need to humble yourself in the sight of God. He knows who you really are. John the Baptist never got the big head about who he was. There came unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem. You know, somebody asked him, said, Art thou the Christ? You know what he said? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That voice, that voice, that voice, that voice. He never tried to trump the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to me and look with me in verse number nine. Jesus, listen, verse five says they were all baptized of him in the river Jordan. Verse nine says that he baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. Jesus said, I and my Father, we are one. God and Jesus are one. John the Baptist baptized God. I know how it works. You get out there and uh, in religious circles and they'll say, how many did y'all baptize? How many did y'all baptize this year? How many did you baptize this last meeting? How many, did you ba- how many of y'all baptize? You know, we had a baptism. How many got baptized? And that's what we start thinking about. We start str- getting a big head about how many. Let me tell you something. John was baptizing them all, and he baptized God. He baptized Jesus. I'm sure you'd have got your cell phone and said, but you've got to be over here. I'm baptizing God today. You'd have texted people. You'd have wrote a book about it. This is how you baptize God. Not John the Baptist. He said, I'm not worthy to baptize you, Lord. I think about his proclamation. Look at verse 7. He preached saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. They were lined up to hear him preach. And as they fell under conviction and they came to get baptized one by one, look at verse 5. They came, what did it say? Confessing their sins. Is that what it says? They were, con- they were not being baptized for salvation. They were confessing their sins. One by one, one came in and said, I'm a thief, but I've got right with God. He's forgiven me. I want to get baptized. Kapui put him under the water. Here come another one now and said, a young lady said, I've been selling my body. I, I, I've been doing dope. I've been, I've been cheating on my chemistry tests. And, and she confessed it and got right with God. And she, poosh, she got baptized. Well, every sing, I'm telling you, every one of us in this place, if we fell under conviction and we need to get saved, we'd have walked up to John the Baptist and we'd have confessed our sins and said, God's forgiven me. And he, hey, thank God, wash my sins away. And they'd have been baptized right on the spot. And in that crowd, come walking one named Jesus. And when he came walking in the water, he had no sins to confess. Woo! And John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. I just want to say this about John as a messenger. If you're not careful, you're going to believe what people tell you. And for, you're going to forget that you're a servant of God. You, they're going to brag on you. They're going to pat you on. I've had it. They're going to pat you on the back. Man, your head's going to want it. I'm telling you, you, you I'm, tonight I'm going to take the pen. Right? Whoever's pumped you up, I'm going to take the pen and let the air out of the balloon. Poop. And let you know that you and I are just sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Preacher, I come here to be encouraged. Don't remind me of who I am. Let me tell you something. You better be careful because if you start believing that you're something else than what you really are, you're headed for a big disaster. I've seen preacher after preacher and young person after young person start believing the press and they got in a mess. Will you hear me? Number two, I want us to see the message. Can you hear John's message, verse 4? John did baptize in the wilderness and what did he do? He preached 
the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Listen to him preach. What did he preach? Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Preacher, that's not what he said. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Let's hear what John the Baptist was preaching that caused all the people to come hear the word of God being declared. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. 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 The Greek word is the word metaneho, which means to be converted. It means a change of heart, a change of purpose, a change of direction, a change of mind. A change of the will. John the Baptist preached repentance. Amen. Go out in the modern day church world and preach that every Sunday and see how many come to hear you preach. Wow. Repentance is becoming a doctrine that is missing in most of our churches. Wow. Young people don't want to hear it anymore. Middle-aged people don't want to hear it anymore. Yeah. The elderly don't want to hear it anymore. But John the Baptist preached repentance. Amen. Well, preacher, I'd rather hear Jesus preach. Honey, I'm glad you will. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 17. Jesus, after he got baptized, he went into the wilderness and he was tempted of the devil, defeated the devil there. And the Bible says in Matthew 4, verse 17, after this, from that time forth, Jesus, are you on the right page? Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached the same thing John preached. You know why? It's the same voice. It's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and unto God it ought to be the voice that's crying out from this pulpit, and wherever you go to hear preaching, it need to be somebody declaring, we need to repent and get right with God. A preacher don't get so fired up on a Wednesday night. Honey, I can't help it. You're here. God's here. And he said, tell them they need to repent and get right with God. Amen. In fact, the first words of the disciples. Go back to Mark. Back to Mark. Let's go to chapter 6. When the disciples went out. Mark chapter 6. Help me, Jesus. Mark chapter 6. The Lord sent them out. Two by two, remember that? And verse number 12, Matthew, Mark, excuse me, Mark 6, verse 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. The first words of John, the first words of Jesus, the first words of the 12 disciples. In fact, you know what Jesus said after his resurrection? Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24. Verse number 46, he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Hey, when Jesus got up from the grave, what's the first thing he preached? Repentance. We ain't thought much about repentance lately, have we? In fact, when the day of Pentecost fell, guess what they preached? Repentance! And 3,000 men got saved. The first words of Paul's ministry in Acts chapter 26, verse 19 and 20, guess what it was? Repentance! We forgot about repentance nowadays in America in the year in which we now live. Number three, I'm trying to move quickly. Number three, I want us to think about the mission. You see, hold on, let me say this. John the Baptist, he wasn't impressed with who he was. And John the Baptist, he was unafraid of what he said. Here's our problem. We got a bunch of pussyfooting preachers who's afraid to get up and preach the truth anymore. They don't want to declare repentance. They don't want to say that sin is sin and that men need to get right with God. I'm telling you, that's the problem. We need to be men like John that's unafraid of what they say. Can I get a witness, church? You want to be in a church like that? I do. Number three, what is his mission? Verse four again, John did baptize in 
the wilderness. I'm going to say this. John was unconcerned where he was. Some people have to be at the First Baptist Church of the big city or it don't even count. I mean, there was a, listen, I listened to a guy online talking about church growth and he said, if your church is not doubled within a year, you're failing in the ministry and you need to get out. Then, right after COVID, and then right behind it he said, and if your church has less than 50, you have a small ministry and you might as well hang it up and try to combine it somewhere else. I, I just want to be honest. I said, Lord, I'd like to, I'd, if I was God, I would put him in the rural area of western North Carolina and let him pastor the first Baptist church of Ebenezer number nine and let him figure out what it's like to really have to get out there and, and, and hoof it and, and struggle and preach. I'm telling you, we need to have a heart. Listen, it's not mattering where you preach. John preached in the wilderness and they all came to hear him. You may say it's not a good location. Unto God, your location don't matter. Preach Jesus. Preacher, you're getting too excited. I can't help it. You know the wilderness, you know where it is? I feel like that's where we are tonight. It's a dry place. It's God that put John in the dry place. And John was not granted a life of ease. Hear me. The mark of your ministry is not, don't you listen to these church growth experts. The mark of your ministry does not determine, it's not determined by where you serve. It's not determined by the size of your congregation. It's determined by your relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you doing, sir, what he called you to do? John was more concerned about what he was to do than where he was to do it. He was obedient and faithful to the call of God. His mission was to hear the news that the Son of God is soon coming. He's prepared the world for the kingdom of heaven. And I would remind you, Bethel Baptist Church, that is our mission as well. We need to prepare this world that Jesus is soon coming. Number four, I want you to see the manner. He did baptize in the wilderness. He did preach the repentance of, he did preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse six, and John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins and he did eat locusts and wild honey. John was uninterested in how much he had. His abode, where did he dwell? In the wilderness. He didn't care anything about living in the lap of luxury. He was concerned about calling people away from the phony hypocrisy of religious system of their day. And look at his attire, camel's hair and a leather belt. The lifestyle of this man would be a rebuke to the modern world of that day and of our day. What did he eat? What, what? He ate locusts. You know what locusts are? Insects. He ate bugs. Hey, after Sunday night service, let's go out to eat with John the Baptist. He's going to go down there to the, oh no, he's, he's going to the locust, wild honey and dine. And you're not going to be happy there. You're going to be uncomfortable with what he's wearing. You're going to be uncomfortable. I'm telling you, you don't want him to be your preacher. He'd walk up in the pulpit and say, he'd walk up in the pulpit and say, good morning, oh generation of vipers. How y'all doing? And everybody came to hear him preach and got right with God. Because he was not intimidated by all the people that came to hear him preach. You know what honey is? Honey is made by bees. And honey, I found out, you'll find it in the rocks of the wilderness. He had honey in the wilderness. That's a sweet place, a blessed place, a good place, in a dry and a weary, thirsty land. Everybody, we want to go where it's happening. I want to go where it's happening. I don't want to go through a dry time. I don't want to go through the wilderness experience. But honey, I'm telling you, having gone through the wilderness from time to time in my life, 
I'm here to report to you there's honey in the wilderness that you and I can rejoice in and we'll be well fed. I thank God for it. Amen. Number five. I'm almost done. Number five. I want us to see the motive. Again, in verse five, they were all baptized of him in the river Jordan. The Bible, Bible says they were confessing their sins. I want to say this about John. He was unshaken by what he saw. He didn't care who was in the congregation. He didn't say, oh, that, that's old millionaire Ted over there. And, and, and that's, he was not worried about who's in the congregation. Let's look at Matthew. I like Matthew's gospel. Matthew presents Jesus as king. Let's see, let's see what Matthew says that John preached in Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 5. They went out to him, excuse me, then went out to him in Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees, uh-oh, and the Sadducees, you see, they don't believe in the resurrection. That's right, that's why they're sad, you see. That's the crowd that came to his baptism. People had different doctrines than what he preached. He said unto them, Oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Whether you as a Pharisee, Sadducee, whether you as a deacon, Sunday school teacher, choir member, didn't make no difference to John. He's preaching the same message. He is unshaken by what he saw. Go back with me now. I got one more point and I'm done. I want to read verses 7 and 8 again. Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He preached saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy. Look at what he says. To stoop down and unloose. Man, that, not just to, not, I'm, I'm not worthy to unloose them. He said, I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose them. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, John gets undertaking in his task that is at hand. He's baptizing. Throngs of people are surrounding him. Jesus comes into that water. Jesus is baptized. And when Jesus' ministry was begun, one day John got up to preach and his associates started counting the crowd and said, Hey, John, we got some empty pews here. They didn't used to be empty. Hey, John, the fact some of the rows aren't even completely full like they used to be. Let's go read about that in John chapter 3. John, the gospel of John chapter 3 and verse number 26. These are some of John's own people. They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. First, some of the crowd was gone. Soon, half the crowd was gone. Soon, three quarters of the crowd's gone. Now there's just a few people still there. And they're pointing out to John. They ain't with you no more, man. They ain't getting your vibe. They ain't getting your message. They ain't with you anymore. Look what old John said in verse 30. Is what he said about Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. This way he's saying, it's okay if the preacher's going down as long as Jesus is going up. Amen. In fact, I think it's high time us preachers, we did start stooping down and let Jesus go up. That's what's needful, amen. He was willing to stand courageously and preach the word of God. Go back to Mark chapter 6. He preached the word. He stood in the face of King Herod. And in verse number 18 of Mark chapter 6, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. He's preaching repentance. 
he, he preached it's, it's wrong to shack up. He preached it's wrong to be having an affair on your wife or on your husband. He's preaching it's wrong to have abortion. It's wrong to have same-sex marriage. It's wrong to have trans transgender. I'm telling you, he preached it's wrong. And for his preaching, they locked him in the prison. In fact, when the young lady, his little stepdaughter there, when she was dancing, he said, oh girl, he was filled with lust and, and drunkenness. Ask me what, I'll give you whatever you ask for, up to half the kingdom. And she said, my mama wants me to ask for the head of John the Baptist in a charger. What? So we can't stand this preaching anymore. Yeah. Tired of his standards. Yeah. Tired. Listen, this is 2000, whatever it is. It's time he preached a different vibe, man. Oh, Times have changed. The way we do it needs to change. Oh, and they took John the Baptist and <laughs> chopped off his head. Wow. Brought it to Herod, and there it was. The disciples went and took up the body of John the Baptist. They buried him. I want to say to you, there came a time later on when Jesus was preaching. They asked Herod, they said, Herod, who is this preaching? He said, it's the voice of John the Baptist. He's arisen from the dead. Honey, I'm telling you something, you can't silence the voice. You go ahead and try to chop the preacher off. You cut it off your radio. You cut it off your TV. You cut it off here at the church and say, nah, 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 nah. I'm here for the singing. I'm not here to hear you. You go ahead and you try to cut it off all you want to, but the Holy Ghost can reach a place in your heart that you can't stop him from speaking to you. Amen. Nowadays, we want preachers to preach to us smooth things. But John was a prophet and a preacher of truth. We live in a day, according to Isaiah 59, 14, that truth has fallen in the street. And again, it may be just as popular as a polecat in the perfume factory. But if you're going to have the approval of God, you cannot compromise to the world. Sin is still sin. All the things I said, homosexuality, abortion, all those things, shacking up, living together, those things are still God, still sin according to God's word. He's not changed, amen. It's better to tell the truth than to compromise, amen. If you tell the truth, you'll be hated. Yeah, I'd rather be hated by the world as to be hated by God. And, and may I just say this? This thought will be popular either, but it's just coming to me. Do you remember in the scripture when Joseph, a man of God, he, he told the people, he said in Genesis chapter 50, he said, God's going to visit you and you'll soon be leaving here. And when you do, you take my bones with you. Don't leave my bones in Egypt. You take my bones to the promised land. And do you know what? 400 years later. How long? 400 years later. God visited his people. And God said, Moses, get them ready. There it's time to depart. And Moses told all the people, get your things. It's time to depart. That final plague fell, the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh said, get out. Just go. Take your, go. We don't want you here anymore. And all the people got up and they started leaving. And can you imagine all the things they needed to get? I mean, they had to get cooking utensils. They had to get clothes. And, and they, had, they had, to get, had to make sure they get all the things they needed. I mean, tonight, if you knew you was going to be leaving to go to a new place, what would you go home and get? You can't take it all. What's you going to get? You got to take some things that's a priority to you. And Moses said, give Joseph's bones. Wait, wait, wait. wait. We don't even know who. who? Joseph's bones. Who, who? Joseph's bones. We don't even know Joseph. He died 400 years ago. Moses said, we made Joseph a promise. You hear me? They don't, sin is sin. Sin is sin. But promises are more important than priorities. If you, will you hear me? You could say, preacher, all them things, shame, 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 sin, sin, sin. If you have made a vow to God and you've made a commitment to God and said, God, I'm going to do such and such, and you decide, well, wait a minute, it's not convenient anymore. Things have changed. I, I've got some new priorities. 
it's just as big a sin in God's eyes. It's been, listen, it's been better not to vow a vow at all than to give your word that you're going to do such and such and then things change and you just change it. Well, Joseph died 400 years ago and Moses said, bless God, we're going to take his bones out of here. And they carried his bones out of there and when they did, they got out there in the wilderness and we know they sinned against God and now they got to go around 40 more years. I, I mean, who was the people that carried Joseph's bones? It doesn't say. These people are unrecognized. Just imagine they sit down by the campfire one night after they've been traveling all day and they said, what do you do for the children of Israel? Oh, I'm over the, she- I'm over the sheep. What do you do? I'm over the cattle. What do you do? I get the firewood to make sure we got something to cook so the kids and all the people have something to eat. What do you do? I'm the minister of bones. You're looking at him. I'm the minister of bones. But that's not important. God said it was. Because when you made a promise to Joseph, you better very well carry out your promise all the way to the end. I, it was pretty popular when I was saying, this is a sin, and this is a sin, and this is a sin. Y'all was amen in the house now. But it's got a whole lot quieter in here when I've told you that if you've given your word about something and you're not following through with your commitment to God, it's just as evil in God's sight as anything else is. Yes, sir. Preacher, what does that? Let me tell you something. John would not break a promise to God He was not intimidated by who he preached to. He was not shaken by what he saw. He was unafraid to stand up to preach the gospel. And we need some men and women in this day and age who are willing to stand up if it hair lips the devil and upsets everybody to preach the word of God. Your personality and you being recognized is unimportant. It never said who carried those bones. It's just important that we carry it through. You see, John's priorities did not get in the way. For preaching, he was put to death. Friends, we would do well to emulate the characteristics of John the Baptist. He was a mighty, useful messenger in the kingdom of God. I'm asking tonight, is there somebody here amongst us that say, Lord, I want to be a servant of God. I want to be used of God. And I'm seeing some things. I'm being intimidated by what I see. I'm being impacted by some things going on. And God help me to have a godly backbone and some godly grit to stay with the stuff through these tough times. You stand to your feet. I'm telling you some folk. You need It's a Wednesday night, but I'm telling you some folk. Repentance, we need to move. I'm telling you, some folk need to move tonight. You need to move up. You say, oh, God, I want to be dedicated. Oh, God, I'm being impacted and influenced. And, Lord, it's not for the rights. It's pulling me away from what you told me to do. And if my job is to carry Joseph's bones, bless God, I'm going to be the best Joseph's bones carrier there is around. Oh, God, help us, church. Father, tonight on bended knee, with a bowed heart, Lord, we say, Lord, we're being influenced by the world to compromise and to conform into what it thinks is right. Help us, God, I pray, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Help us, O Lord, our God, to have some godly grit and, Lord, to stay true to the ministry Lord, that you have given us. God, you've given us a message. And God, we need to be a useful messenger. God, tonight, it may be unlikely and it may be unusual, but God, people can still serve you in the modern day in which we live and be faithful to your cause. And you bless them in a mighty, miraculous way. Lord, I pray for somebody tonight whose faith is weak. God, that you would help them, Lord, to be encouraged, to stay true to the stuff that the Lord has not changed his call upon them and their service unto the Lord remains the same. Help us, God, to be obedient. Help us, God, to be faithful. Help us, God, I pray. And Bethel, 
to serve you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen and amen. I want to say this, and I hope they get it on tape. There was an old boy. He was a slob. I mean, he was a professional slob. He was always a mess at everything he did. He believed, why ever make up your bed? Because you're just going to get right back in it after a while. That drives me nuts. I'm telling you, the first thing I do is make up my bed. That's my first task of the day, getting out after I pray. That's my first task of the day, getting something done, is making up the bed. That's important to me. I'm going to tell you something. This boy, man, dishes everywhere, clothes everywhere, underwear everywhere. He's just a mess. And one day he met a beautiful girl. He took a liking to her. But he would never bring her back to his house because he didn't want her to see what a slob he was. And finally, he knew he wanted to marry her and he was going to change his ways. He went and hired a counselor. He went to 12 classes where they taught him no longer to be a slob, where he started using the muscles in his arms to hang his shirts up again, where he started working with, you know, how sometimes your fingers don't work good, but where they get in there and start washing the dishes and cleaning things up, and he did. And he got that girl to marry him, and they moved together after they got married and united in matrimony, and finally, after about a year, she said, I've got to go away on a women's conference. I'll be gone for a week, he went. That'll be okay. We're going to miss you, honey. It's going to be sad. And immediately he returned to his slobality. Immediately he quit folding, washing the dishes, washing his clothes, things piling up every which way. But here's the difference. Now, where before it didn't bother him, now it is. Because he realizes he can do better and he's made a new commitment. And all of a sudden, the right thing kicked in and he got back to work and when she came back it was pristine, nice, excellent, clean and he said, oh how I've missed you. I'm just saying this to you. In the world in which we live we don't need no shabby, slobby Christians. Preacher, you said slobby. You meant sloppy. I mean both. I put them together, slobby people. Amen? If God called you, you stay with him. Stay with the stuff. Don't go back to the, listen, stay with it. Amen. I appreciate you being here. I hope you have a great rest of your week. I look forward to continuing studying the book of Mark. I wanted so bad to preach more about the baptism of Jesus and Jesus getting driven in the wilderness. But the Holy Ghost said, you got some folk tonight that are being impacted by the world and influenced by the world in which they live. And they some people pumping your ears full of stuff right now. And it's got your head turning and your heart filled with something. And God said, that's not me. That's people bragging on you. But that ain't me. Father, we love you. Help us to go in grace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, God bless you. You're at liberty to go. Good to have you tonight in the house of the Lord.